So welcome to what's new in PowerShell 3.0. This is really a quick overview of not every new feature, but some of what I think are the coolest new features and will generally be of the most use to you. Uh, so my name is John Savile. I was an 11-time Microsoft MVP. Uh, I still write ntfact.com, although it's <laughs> gone for a number of renames since I first started it. I'm a senior contributing editor for Windows IT Pro Magazine. I've written five books on Windows. Uh, I speak a lot of the industry events, such as TechEd and Windows Connections. I've started a blog recently, so you can sort of follow the work I'm doing and some fun stuff that's out there related to technology. And obviously, I, I post these videos to my YouTube channel. And I'm actually just about to start a live in-person event called the John Savills Masterclass that I'm going to do at certain cities around the US and maybe one day around the world. So this is the agenda. So I want to actually firstly talk about not even PowerShell, but the new environment we have to actually use PowerShell, the new integrated scripting environment, which if you're new to PowerShell, and even if you're an experienced PowerShell developer, is really a, a huge new feature. I want to talk about the new updatable help system, and then some of the new auto loading of modules that makes in some ways it's simpler in terms of using PowerShell, but certainly we need to be aware of this new behavior to make sure we know exactly what commandlets we're getting in our PowerShell sessions. Talk about some of the changes to the language to make it simpler, the new PowerShell web access capability, and then really some of the new session features, disconnected sessions, robust session connectivity, workflows, and even scheduling jobs. So firstly, the new PowerShell integrated scripting environment. So I'm actually just gonna jump over. So this is the new PowerShell integrated scripting environment. And we can see a number of cool things here. So we have a scripting environment up here. So I can create scripts, write complex sequences. I have an interactive window down here. So if I run a command, if I run a script, it's gonna show me the output, or I can just start typing from within here. And notice what started to happen when I typed. As I type now, it features IntelliSense. It's starting to guess, well, what is the command you're most likely wanting to use? It happens for the switches as well. Okay, git process name. Okay, maybe. And look at what it's doing. It's actually showing me the processes that could match even for this particular parameter. So show me all the VM worker processes. So a fantastic feature in terms of really getting up and running and using PowerShell in a great way. We have this new form-based help. So let's say I didn't know what I was doing, which happens a lot in what I do. I can search for it. Or maybe I would just search for, well, I want to do something with processes. Okay, these are all the commandlets I can use. Great. And it's showing me the various options related to that command. I could then fill in the various parameters I wanted. So maybe it's a computer name. And I can say insert. It's going to create that command for me that I can now just run. So it's actually helping me how I use this. There's great debugging capabilities. I mean, if I did have a more complicated script, so let's actually jump to saying, so this is my install patch script I wrote a while ago. I can actually insert things like breakpoints in here. So I can toggle breakpoints. I can run the script and then evaluate the various variables for the things I'm trying to do right now. So it's very powerful environment for doing that scripting. If you are a developer, if you're used to Visual Studio, one of the things you'll like is something called Regions. And Regions is this nice example that let's say I have a really big script. Well, it gets very cumbersome to look around that. Regions allow me to just collapse code. So here I have a region for miscellaneous commands. So you start off the hash region tag and then the name of the region, enter whatever you want and then hash end region. I can now collapse that. So it's a great way to really have a lot of different areas of your code, or maybe just random commands, quickly available to me. Let's say I want to write some new code. Snippets is now a part. If I do the control key plus J, so control J, I get this snippet. It helps me create chunks of code. So maybe I want to do a do while or for each. Let's click it. And it creates me the skeleton code that I can then go and fill in the details. 
So it's helping me create that brand new code. I could right click, start snippets, and I can access it from there as well. The help is also updatable. So in the past, help was really part of the command lines. And sometimes maybe they wanted to update that help, make it more useful, give better examples. Well, now it's actually dynamically pulling it down from the internet really whenever we want. So as I was accessing these different parameters, let's say I type in VHD, for example, it's actually recently just pulled this down. It went and pulled this down from the internet. I can force an update. I can actually say update help. And it's then gonna go and talk to the internet, pull down the latest help modules, refresh what I have, so I have the latest help. Now that's great if you have an internet connection. If you don't, you can use the save dash help commandlet. So we've saved dash help. What it's actually gonna do is put this in a folder I specify. So I specify that destination path. It's gonna pull it down. And now I can use that from other machines. So if I wanted to use that update help once it already run save help, I can actually say, well, where do I wanna pull it from? Type in that path that I ran the update help from. Now, whenever you manually run get help, it's gonna go and pull down that latest help for you. But what I can actually do as well, if I delete this, is I can actually say, well, give me the help, but you know what? Show it to me online. So it's actually gonna launch a web browser and show me the help for that commandlet directly in the internet. Maybe it's easier for me to read. All that help, fantastic, available to me. And if you were ever curious about, well, exactly how is it doing that? A nice little trick is, this is just really an attribute. So I can say get command, update help. And what I want you to do, show me what that help URI is. Bang. So that's the web it would actually go to. Simpler language. So if you look at the history of PowerShell, it's kind of gone from, I think, maybe 100 commandlets in version 1, maybe 200 in version 2, to 2400 in version 3. That's a big leap. And so in PowerShell 3, the syntax has really been focused on this idea of least cognitive distance. I think about what I want to do, and that should be what the command is. It follows that verb noun format. So I want a new VHD. Well, my command should be new VHD. It really should follow exactly what I want to do. So some of the core commandlets maybe have been renamed, but alias has been put in so that old name would still actually function. But some of those existing aliases, sorry, those existing commandlets have had new things added to them. For example, if you look at get child item, it has a number of new parameters. So I can say, for example, well, show me just directories, show me hidden files, show system. So it now gives you a far more powerful environment, which I could have accomplished before, but I would have maybe been using where code for each more complicated syntax. That's gone away. There's more functionality built into the commandlets. One huge area is around SIM. So that common information model and the use of web services management. So these are two standards. And this is at the root, really, of PowerShell 3. This means any system that follows those common standards, that common information model, web services management, can now be managed using PowerShell v3. And WMI2 is all based around SIM as well. SMIS support is built in, so most storage arrays will support SMIS. Remote management is enabled by default on Windows Server 2012. So if I don't do anything, if I just deploy a new Windows Server 2012, I can manage it with PowerShell. I can manage it with Server Manager. So really quickly, I mean, if I look at that SIM example, so I can get a look at all the commands in that SIM commandlets module. I can say, well, show me all the things related to disk. Show me what the methods are related to term, as in terminate something. So I can say, look, I can terminate processes. I can look, for example, at all of my processes. And I'm showing this against the Windows system. Sure, but the whole point of this is 
it really would work against anything that's utilizing those standards, SIM and WSMAN. Now I talked about simplification. Now let's just take an example. We're probably all used to taking that get process I just did. We can just use get process. And maybe I wanna show everything where the handle count, notice it, that IntelliSense is helping me, is greater than a thousand. So there's a few processes there of a handle count greater than a thousand. And one of the things people struggle with commonly is what is this dollar underscore thing? I have no idea what that is. So you can now use PS item instead. So it's a, a more to type, but it's more intuitive. Okay, it's that item, so I can use PS item. I don't even have to use that. I can take out those squiggly brackets and just show me where the handle count is greater than a thousand. Bang. And I, I can even use GPS. GPS is just an alias for get process. So I could have built that into that command as well. And that applies to a lot of the things. Um, let's say I fire off three instances of notepad. So I've got three notepads running. We could say get process notepad. And there's those three instances. Now, if I wanted to select, maybe do something with each of those items. In the past, I might have said, get process and just show me the ID of those items. The challenge is that's really not that useful. I can't do much with those values now. So maybe instead what you had to do in the past is maybe I say a for each. And I could have said dollar underscore or I can use my new PS item, ID. So now I can actually do things with those items, but I don't need that. Get rid of the squiggly bracket. Get rid of the dollar PS item, same thing. And then kill them. Killed off those processes very, very easily. Now this looks great. This is Windows 8, Windows Server 2012, it's just there. But also, it's available for Windows Server 2008, 2008 R2, and Windows 7. Go and download the Windows Management Framework 3.0, install it. It not only gives you PowerShell 3, it gives you the new updates to Windows Management Instrumentation, Windows Remote Management, and that SIM provider for Server Manager that lets us manage Windows Server 2008 and 2008 R2 from the Windows Server 2012 version of Server Manager. So a great, great feature. The next nice feature is robust connections. And PowerShell is great for managing my local box, but really the power of PowerShell is when I'm managing a remote machine, five remote machines, a hundred remote machines. And the challenge in the past is if there was some interruption to my connectivity, well, I lost what was happening. Well, now PowerShell will on its own reestablish that connection for up to four minutes. It will just keep retrying. And I could even show this. So let's take an example of just how great this functionality is. So I'm using my regions. And I've already prepared some code. That was my simplification example. But look at my robust session. So I'm gonna create a new session I'm gonna get the current date and I'm gonna disconnect. So I've disconnected from that session. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this chunk of code and I'm not even gonna try and reconnect on this machine. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna jump locally to that box. And then on that box, well, let's see if I can resume that. So I'm gonna look at all the sessions I have. Sure enough, there's that disconnected session. I'm gonna create a local session because I'm on that box to it. And I'm gonna look at well, what is the value of that variable I set? Sure enough, it kept it. And now I can get it and remove them. So it, it maintained, it would have come back anyway. If I'd have been accidentally disconnected, PowerShell would have kept retrying and connected me into that session. So this is fantastic for that remotable experience that I'm not gonna lose my work. Now when I talk about work, we have workflows. Imagine complicated sequences of actions across multiple machines that may take five minutes, 10 minutes, hours. Well, I can trigger that and disconnect. I can pause a workflow and resume it, providing we create some checkpoints. Now I should point out, you can force a pause by using the dash 
full switch. However, if you force it, if there are no checkpoints built into the workflow, you're going to lose your state. It may just restart from the beginning again. But there are some great parameters for workflows. I can look, I can pass it to a whole list of machines. I can pass a credential. I can define a quota for how long it's allowed to run for and even retry count parameters. Let me jump back again. And I've actually got a really basic workflow. So this workflow is hello, is that hello world. So I'm going to create a workflow. I can, if I, it was more complicated and had syntax, I could look at what are the syntaxes supported and I can run it. Hello. Now created a more complicated one. Now what you have noticed here, to simulate lots of work, I write some output and then I sleep for 10 seconds. Then I put in a checkpoint. These are the points I can pause. So I'm going to create that workflow and I'm going to start it as a job. And I can see it's running. Now I'm now going to say suspend that job. Now it's going to suspend as soon as it can. As soon as it hits, after that 10 seconds, now it's suspended. I can say, well, show me everything that job has done so far. So, so far I'd only got to that first bit of text where it said loading some information. Okay, I'm going to resume it again. I can get the status of my job. I can say, well, show me that output again. And because I'm doing keep, it's keeping the old format again. It's not losing any of that detail. Cleaning up. And then it's going to complete in a second. And then it's done. And now I can just kill it off. So great workflow capabilities. And notice even here, even without the regions, I can collapse and expand chunks of code with that squiggly bracket. So finally, I want to talk about scheduled jobs. So this is the idea that I don't want to be in the office at 2 a.m. to start my PowerShell. I just want to create a trigger. And then within that trigger, call a bunch of script. So I've got an example for here as well. So I'm going to create a trigger that's daily at 2 a.m. I'm going to register a scheduled job. Totally useless, but say get process. I can then look at my scheduled job. I can look at what the trigger is. I can look at just that scheduled job if I had more than one. And if I jump over here, if I actually navigate to the task scheduler and look at Microsoft, Windows, PowerShell, scheduled jobs, there it is. I can actually go and see my scheduled job in there. And I can even say what it's going to do within this. So total integration, taking advantage of the built-in task scheduler. And then I can kill it at the end. So this is not everything, but these are the things that I think have some of the most major impacts to how you're going to leverage PowerShell. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you are interested, I do have my masterclass certification, uh, one week sort of in-person event that currently I'm doing around sort of the Texas area, but would love to do it in more cities and would love to meet you and uh, let me know if you're interested. Go to that site and have a look. I appreciate your time. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.